Here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Marco Renzo. Welcome to our presentation, the animation pipeline uh, of uh, Mario Plus Rabbit Kingdom Battle. Uh, I'm the animation director at Ubisoft Milan, and I'm here today with uh, Tommaso Sanguini, our animation technical director at Ubisoft Milan. And it's amazing to have you all here today. We are super, super excited to be able to show you some of the tools we've been working on in the past few years and talk a bit about the reason why they've been necessary in the first place. But before we start, let me show you a quick trailer for those of you who do not know the game. Who do you think you are? You should kneel on the start. You are nothing but a parody. I like your good role in a tragedy. Here come in, that's a go, the only part you know. My heart will touch your princess's heart, and you will be the part. You think you'll win this tournament. I think you do such a mess. So, what kind of game is exactly Mario Plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle? Well, it's a Nintendo Switch exclusive uh, uh, turn-based tactical adventure starring uh, Ubisoft Rabbits and, of course, Mario and his friends. The project has been developed in the last four years by Ubisoft Milan and Ubisoft Paris in collaboration with Nintendo. And the gameplay is uh, composed by two main parts. There's an exploration where the player is free to move around, uh, solve puzzles, uh, find coins, uh, and collect items uh, such as uh, new weapons, artworks, uh, and uh, music tracks, and uh, a tactical combat phase. And here the player can plan the strategy to win the battles. You can use different uh, characters, uh, choose different moving and attack abilities, different kind of weapons, uh, and uh, fight various kind of enemies. and uh, unlock and upgrade the skills that will help you progress through the game and uh, beat increasingly hard fights. So here's a quick overview of what we'll discuss today. The talk will be split into parts. And the first one, I'll show you how this project came to life and what kind of goals and constraints we had to, take in, to consider when planning our pipeline. This would be key to understand how these factors translated into our tools. In the second part, in fact, uh, um, starting from these uh, requirements, Tommaso will discuss the technical implementation of some of them, uh, showing the functionalities that made uh, this project possible. So where did we start? We started from here, a paper prototype, uh, and then a digital one made with the Unity 3D and a pipeline based on Motion Builder. And I still remember how surreal uh, at the moment I was told we were going to work with Mario was, uh, a game movie Mario and the rabbits. It just sounded insane. But as crazy as it sounded, we sure didn't want to mess it up. I mean, you don't get every day the chance to animate Mario, let alone to present a prototype staring him to Nintendo itself. That's why we wanted uh, to be as respectful as possible with both brands, uh, Nintendo and Ubisoft IPs. So we studied meticulously previous games, uh, looking for references and going through them frame by frame and try to learn as much as we could, uh, as fast as we could. Yeah, because the plan was uh, to show something playable in just a few weeks. So we managed to pack a prototype and present it to Miyamoto-san. And uh, uh, his reaction was great. He did not expect something playable, and uh, he was actually surprised by the amount of detail uh, uh, we put into it. But he also added something uh, that, uh, during that meeting, uh, something that would completely uh, change our approach to the game. He literally told us, uh, make a Mario game that has never been done before. Meaning uh, to be innovative, proposing something new, fresh, somewhat uh, unique and unusual. And 
receiving this feedback, uh, we realized that he was encouraging us uh, to fully express ourselves, to get out of our comfort zone and uh, try the unexpected. And we deeply thought about his advices and defined uh, what became the core pillars of our game, based on our passions as game makers, of course, but also as gamers. So first one, we chose an unexplored genre for both the Mario and the Rabbit IPs. And uh, as you can imagine, this decision brought challenges. First of all, it's, it's a genre usually considered as complex and for a very specific public of dedicated players. Secondly, it involves uh, many new mechanics and interactions between characters. Now, from an animation point of view, this is a huge, huge deal. Suddenly, not only we had to bring to life probably the most iconic character of the whole industry, but uh, also make him perform actions he had never performed before and uh, make him look believable and acceptable by the fans. Now, add the rabbits to the equation, and <laughs> it was challenging. So once we decided the genre, uh, we focused on the mood we wanted for the battles. And have you ever played with water guns in a hot uh, summer afternoon? or maybe with the snowballs during the winter. That's the kind of mood we wanted to convey. We wanted to be colorful, we wanted to be playful, joyful. And the video here shows the very first proof of concept of our core system. It should give you an idea of the tone we set for the whole combat system of the game. And then Carters. Our goal was uh, to communicate their personalities and let them feel well-grounded into the world. And as I said earlier, having Nintendo characters performing new actions was a challenge by itself, but at least their personality is uh, well-defined with uh, tons of reference uh, to study and analyze. The rabbits, however, historically have always had a generic personality. And the challenge we set for ourselves uh, was to make each one of them feel unique. We did not want them to simply cosplay as their Nintendo counterparts. We want them to have a unique uh, personality, thought process, and acting choices, which is basically a dream for an animator. Okay, so we identified our core pillars, tactical genre, hide and seek mood, unique characters. It was time to implement them into the game and focus on uh, the mechanics. On our side, on the animation side, though, uh, to be able to achieve these goals, we had to first and foremost answer a simple yet complex question. How do we mix and balance characters so different? I mean, just look at that. And let's be honest here. I guess the reaction most people have when they hear for the first time about a game mixing uh, the Mario universe and the rabbits is uh, at the very least surprise, maybe confusion. So it was obvious uh, that we, it was of the utmost importance uh, for us to find a way to mix uh, these two worlds in a way that felt new and fresh, uh, but also believable. And the way we approached this problem uh, was letting the two brands uh, mutually influence each other. For example, from Mario, like I said earlier, the rabbits gained a strong personality and a unique personality. Every rabbit here is a parody or an exaggerated version of the Nintendo counterpart. But we didn't stop there, of course. In fact, the usual clarity of the Nintendo character's posing has been applied to the, also to the rabbits. Strong line of actions, clear silhouette, great readability. The concept of posing as a mean to communicate gameplay rules are all, are, are all state-of-the-art elements in Mario games. And these elements have been key for us because they made, made the actions read clearly from the gameplay camera, which in our case is quite far away, and communicate mechanics without overloading the player with the information from the UI. Here's some examples with the rabbits. And their shapes are challenging. A huge head, very short legs. And to push their poses, we focus on the line of action of the two main masses, head and torso, and use the ears to strengthen the line, like in the poses here of Rabbit Luigi and Rabbit Yoshi, for example, or to create a rhythm with S curves going through their bodies, like in the case of Rabbit Peach and Rabbit Mario. The timing and spacing uh, have been uh, affected by this mix as well. And in most cases, it has been, they've been inspired by Mario. For example, cycles, damage animations, locomotion speed have all been set and tuned using Mario as a reference since he's always present in the party. As a result, 
Rabbits are now more organic and way less snappy compared to the past, because generally speaking, their animations last longer. Here's an example. Two walks, and if you look at the rabbit peach, you can notice how her walk is as much slower compared to the typical generic walk of the past. And one of the reasons we made it this way is that it just felt more natural when coupled with Mario. Here's another example with the damage animation. And it's interesting to notice how the animations last exactly the same number of frames, but the Ziggy on the right, which is one of our enemy archetypes, it's much more exaggerated in terms of deformations and spacing. Moreover, we realized that the characters should not look in pain. And therefore, in our game, they're not suffering and they do not die. Uh, heroes are just knocked out, and enemies are set free from a malicious influence. On the other hand, the rabbits. Uh, they have introduced their humor and their craziness to Mario's world. This was key for us, because it created the contrast and it helped uh, to push the personality of the characters. We wanted to develop a new take on the Mushroom Kingdom, keeping its familiar tone, uh, yet feeling fresh at the same time. We try to push the humor both on gameplay and in cinematics. Uh, here's a couple of examples from gameplay. And we looked for every opportunity to add some humor, like damages, uh, bosses. Uh, just love Rabbi Kong, he's awesome. Simple runs. or losing animations. And as you can see here on the left, Rabbi Peach really hates losing. Man. And here are some more examples from uh, this, our cinematics. And uh, as you can see here, we had the fun playing around a bit with the personalities and relationships between the characters. So, Peach and Rabbi Peach. Mario and Rabbit Mario. <laughs> Rabbits and Luigi. <laughs> oh. Poor Luigi. Yeah. Rabbit Peach, Mario and Peach. <laughs> and here's a sequence uh, which I believe perfectly gather all these elements. Who's done me a thousand wrongs ever since Donkey Kong? Seethering down every pipe, despite his plum shaped body type. Who's gonna run in fear while screaming, Mamma Mia? Who leaves me gray and grim? Oh, what does Peach see in him? Mario! And I truly believe these are examples of interactions that have been possible for us to make solely because, uh, thanks to the rabbits and their innate ability to break the rules and get any character out of uh, their comfort zone. Obviously, we had to mix uh, the cartoony style of both IPs, uh, but we wanted to push forward, exploring new directions. Uh, in order to do this, we exaggerated the deformations, uh, especially through squash and stretch, to achieve a more organic feeling. Rigs have been built to support these kind of uh, animations and deformations. So here are some a couple of examples with uh, Robbie Kong, and as you can see, the animator has really a lot of freedom in the way they can uh, adjust and change the shapes uh, of the character. Sometimes too much, probably. And you can uh, also see how specific uh, each one of them is uh, due to huge differences uh, in terms of the design and size between all the characters, heroes and enemies. An example of uh, the formations is uh, the use of smear frames. And uh, the rabbits usually feature full body extreme deformations, 
while for the Nintendo characters, uh, they are limited only to the extremities and used very sparingly. So here's, an, uh, for example, Rabbit Peach, or uh, what Rabbit, and uh, here you can see how the whole masses is uh, changing, it's deforming. While for uh, Luigi, it's limited only to his feet, and hopefully you won't notice it in real time. <laughs> So we had our goals set on a specific style. It was time to focus on the actual implementation of some of the core mechanics. And uh, we first started from the locomotion. We actually have two types of locomotion in combat and uh, during the exploration phase, and each one of them has its own set uh, of specific animations. They are both co-driven. In order to achieve a classic arcade feeling, and plus it allowed the designers to tune it as much as they wanted without having a strong dependency on our work. And the same is true for special movement abilities like the dash uh, or the team jump. And uh, here you can see an example of, you know, of uh, Luigi chaining these actions, uh, dashing an enemies, uh, and jumping on top of uh, Rabbit Luigi, and going back to cover. Speaking of which, our cover system is actually animation driven. This allowed the animators uh, to push as much as possible interactions between uh, the characters and the environment. And this is especially true during the combat phase as the characters interact a lot with covers. Here, for example, Rabbit Luigi leaning out of, of uh, an half cover. We have a total of uh, several cover positions uh, between low and high ones. And as you can see in the video, each position displays a different idol. Also, having unique characters means that each one of them needs a different way of taking cover. And the transitions, which uh, have been uh, for us equally important. We spent a lot of time and attention to make sure that each one of them stayed true to their character. They are not simply a bridge between state A and state B, but they are key to convey the personality. Uh, if you look at the video, the way Rabbit Yoshi and Rabbit Mario switch side of the cover tells a lot about their character. And uh, here's another example of one of our enemies uh, playing different animations uh, depending on the starting and ending position. So left to right, uh, front to back, also back right to left front, and so on. And Another area that's worth mentioning is the targeting mechanic. And uh, from a gameplay point of view, its goal is to easily communicate to the player if the, targeted, uh, if the target will be hit or not. If the character is hiding, it means no chance of success. And also you can see here the line of action of uh, Rabbit Mario being pushed. And the characters, of course, have their own personalities, so they react accordingly. So here's an example with one of our enemies, and the reaction is also based on the position of the attacker. So if Mario is in front of him, he will have a reaction, but if he's on, in, on his side, he will react differently. And of course, uh, again, uh, in different heroes, different reactions, so Rabbit Yoshi will probably react differently compared to Rabbit Mario. <laughs> yeah. We love uh, Italian acting cliches, but we, we're Italians, so we can. So another tiny detail that might be hard to notice, but when you are attacking and the character uh, and another character is on the way, the one in the middle will uh, duck um, to give the idea he's actually trying to get himself out of the way. So Mario is trying to dodge the bullet here. And props, of course, have been used to better define the characters. So what's interesting is the fact that it happened quite a few times that we added props that were not included in the original design of the character to support specific animations that were crucial to push his or her personality. For example, the mustache, the toothpick, the mandolin, and the pizza of Rabbit Mario have been introduced very, very late in the development cycle to bring his personality on par with the other heroes. And again, of course, to convey humor and parody. So everything you've seen so far, hopefully, has shed some light on some of the artistic challenges we had to overcome. 
But I guess that no project comes without its own amount of uh, technical challenges, and this one was no different. In fact, first of all, we had to switch to a game, a new game engine, and as Snowdrop is the latest Ubisoft proprietary game engine, it has been chosen for its uh, flexibility, scalability, and of course rendering quality. But it was built with a division in mind, uh, which was a, which is a totally different game compared to our project. We also had to develop for a new console, and probably you only mean, you'll know what it means, right? We also had to handle. Uh, um, two important IPs, which meant that not only the artists had to learn how to work with the characters, learning their psychology and mechanics to the point of knowing them by heart, but we also had to learn how to handle the feedback uh, received, which would come at any time during the, the process. And we also started with a fairly small animation team. In fact, we started with just uh, four animators, uh, one pipeline TD, and one character rigger. So to sum up, we developed on a new engine, a new console. We had to prepare to react to a feedback we've never received before with a small team that was working on a Nintendo IP for the very first time. So how? <laughs> how did we avoid all the mistakes we were leading into? Actually, we didn't. Uh, what we did was planning for mistakes. We quickly realized that uh, there were just too many variables uh, and avoiding mistakes would have been imp simply impossible. Therefore, we focused on planning uh, the inevitable mistakes, giving our animators uh, ways to explore, experiment, prototype new ideas, uh, and above anything else, uh, learning while doing so. We set the time for them to prototype and experiment or simply play with the characters. And these gave birth to some of the coolest ideas that we ended up implementing in the game. So here you can see some examples of this process. And if you look at the animation in the bottom row, for example, they've been used in some way or the other in the game. And our tools and uh, pipeline have been developed to simplify and increase the speed of the iteration process, to give the artists this kind of space, to, in order to let them express themselves in, and iterate on their animations, even at the an advanced state of the production. And uh, Tommaso will now show you some of these tools uh, which have been key to the success of the project. Hello everyone, it's such great to be here. It's now time to go a little bit uh, more technical. As you can imagine, after all the consideration that Marco has made so far, we were, we were heading for a huge amount of keyframe animation data. And uh, as a technical uh, department, we wanted to make sure that the iteration on this uh, amount of data wasn't uh, frustrating for the artist. So we tried to keep uh, being focused on these two main concepts for the development of the pipeline. Freedom to, to explore in order to let the animators easily manipulate such amount of data, and fast iteration. In our case, in special, especially in order to react uh, quickly to the feedbacks that could arrive from both IPs anytime at any stage of the production. The first step was to find a logical way to rationalize and organize such an amount of animation data. If we could arrange multiple clips in the same file, it is easier for the animators to iterate and compare on related animation clips. There are different ways of achieving this. If you are on a motion builder, you could take advantage of the take system. But our pipeline is on Maya, and we don't have a native take system. We try to arrange clips on the timeline one after the other. We try to use the tracks editor, but in the end, we decided to go for animation layers, as uh, at first glance it looked like to be the answer to our question. However, for uh, the animators, working with the animation layer wasn't uh, really intuitive. If you have to move one clip or the other, you have to turn on the corresponding animation layer, turn off the others, uh, adjust the timeline, and so on. So collecting all the feedbacks we received from the animators, we came up with our text system in Maya. It is basically animation layers wrapped with additional functionalities, something very simple but very effective. 
From a very simple interface, the animators can uh, handle the different takes present in the current scene. And for each one of them, you can still have uh, additive animation layers. Let's see the tool in action. The animator can select the controls he wants to animate. From the takes pane, he can create a new take and assign a nice name for it. and adjust the timeline. As you can see, when the timeline changes, the new frame range is recorded inside the take uh, pane. And then the animator can keep working as usual. After a while, what you'll get, of course, is a single animation on a take. And anytime the animator can right click and create a new take, or uh, just uh, adjust the time, the time range. Rename the take, of course. And uh, even assign a nice color. As you will see in the next slide, we took advantage of the color coding a lot in our pipeline. Since we have a lot of animation, using color coding is very effective to have a quick uh, feedback on the related animations. After a while, what you'll get is uh, a single uh, Maya file with different clips. And you can see how it is reactive for the animator to just click on a specific take and activate the corresponding clip. The frame range is uh, adjusted. The timeline is uh, color-coded to reflect the current uh, active take. And uh, we, we took advantage of uh, metadata and attributes. So something very simple uh, uh, like uh, a reordering uh, takes is very quick compared to reordering, reordering animation layers. We stressed the take system and the animation layers to the max. And it resulted to be so reliable and so effective and so intuitive for the animators that, that we started to build upon of this uh, simple tool. So we integrated the text system with uh, our exporter on the left and our process library on the right. But uh, we didn't stop there, of course. Even if our scene files are under version control, we may want it to save in the same Maya file different versions of the same uh, animation clip. So we, we created a tech version system in a way that the animator can uh, realize such uh, functionality. Let's see it in action. The animator can right click on a specific take and create a new version for that take. It can be an empty version or a duplicate of the current version. And he can animate uh, the one version or the other. As you can see here, the animator can uh, right click and activate a specific version for the take. As the different version belong to the same take, in export it will result as a single clip. And this is very nice to, it is very effective to keep uh, very nice and uh, uh, clean uh, uh, files in exports. But let's suppose that uh, you have a specific version that you like so much and you want to have like a separate, uh, separate take and uh, create a version upon, on that. Anytime the animator can right click uh, on a take and extract the current version. And uh, this will become a, a separate take. This is uh, very simple and quick since uh, as said before, we use uh, metadata and node networks to um, create such a meta structure on the takes. And uh, of course, you have the opposite function. You can uh, set a specific take to be a subversion of another take. And time markers. For each take, uh, we also added the possibility to set uh, specific time markers. Uh, this will allow, allow the animators to visually uh, mark specific areas of the timeline. As you can see here, the animator can uh, select uh, a specific area of the time range of the timeline and uh, mark this area, in this case as an interface. The 
then it keeps working by selecting another area and marking this an hydro as a um, idle phase. And just like I uh, said before, you can assign a, a specific color coding for that area. It may sound like something very simple, but uh, um, the good thing here is that the animator can uh, frame anytime the specific area of the timeline. This is very effective for, uh, for instance, for uh, framing the idle phase and making sure that uh, the looping uh, animation is working properly. And uh, also, the animator has the possibility to export the uh, markers uh, separately or as a wall. I don't know if you, how many of you have played the game? How many of you have played the game? Yeah, cool, very cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there, we have uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, gameplay cinematics where we have balloons uh, that you have to confirm. And uh, this tool has been crucial for us to make sure that during the uh, idle animations, during the balloon being visible, we, um, the idle was working properly. As you can see, all the tools are uh, uh, very uh, relative to our domain, but uh, our focus was always to uh, design for the animators. As you saw earlier, the transitions play a key role in our game. And uh, we made uh, this very simple tool for uh, automating the creation of the takes for these transitions. From this interface, the animator can uh, freeze different uh, poses and uh, the tool takes care of uh, generating the possible transitions between these poses. And a uh, nice color coding is automatically assigned. Then we have some uh, other little extra features, like uh, the ability to mark specific takes to, the, to be ignored. Uh, let's suppose you use uh, takes for uh, um, just storing poses or whatever you want and you don't want this to be exported. And then we have the ability to mirror specific takes. See here, rapid reach going from, le from left to right, and uh, the tool creates the opposite uh, uh, clip, having rapid reach going from right to left. The same way, we can create a reverse uh, of the current take, we have Rabbit Luigi going from cover left to back, and we can reverse the animation and, and having a take going from back to cover left. It's, not, it's now time to see how we uh, took advantage of the take system. Here you can see a typical uh, file structure of uh, one of our heroes. As you can see, it's, uh, it's very nice and uh, clean. All that uh, light blue files are our Maya scenes. And on the right, you can see uh, an example with uh, Rabbit Mario. Starting from uh, 92 Maya scenes, the animators generated uh, 592 takes, and in export, uh, there was just uh, 530 exports. Could you, could you imagine iterating on 530 Maya files separately? Probably it's a nightmare. And uh, here you can see one of the heaviest scenes, just to give you a uh, quick uh, feedback in terms of performance. On the left, you can see the standard uh, My Animation layers. On the right, our take system. Every time the animator clicks on a specific take, the corresponding animation layer is activated, the uh, time range is uh, adjusted, the markers are, are made visible, and so on. Again, handling such uh, amount of animation layers manually, it would have been a nightmare for the animator. Let's talk about uh, poses now. Uh, we have seen with Marco how important are poses uh, for uh, us in order to convey the personality of the character and uh, to give feedbacks in terms of uh, the gameplay status of the character. In our case, having poses uh, under version control and shared uh, wasn't enough. We had to find a, a way to be as reactive as possible to the feedbacks. Here you can see a typical uh, feedback that uh, our animators received during the, during the production. And uh, they had a very um, short time to address such kind of feedbacks. 
For the, these reasons, uh, we needed to track where and how the poses had been used and eventually update them automatically. So we created a post system. The post system is made of a classic uh, post library, a poses tab storing the poses used in uh, the current take, and uh, uh, the timeline where you can uh, see where the pose has been used. Let's see it in action. Every time the animator apply a pose from the library, the pose is marked on the timeline and on the poses tab. Since we might have poses for the body, poses for the face, or any other uh, different limbs uh, or uh, uh, props, uh, um, the pose system stores not only the which pose has been applied and where, but also how the pose has been, has been applied in terms of controls, for instance. So we, we could have different poses applied on the same frame. Yeah, you can see here after a while all the poses applied. And uh, from the poses tab, uh, uh, you can click on a specific pose uh, that it will act uh, pretty much like a bookmark to go straight to that uh, frame where the pose has been applied. And also you can check the synchronization status of the pose. Let's have a look at how we update a pose to react to a feedback. When a feedback arrives, the animator can right click on that specific pose, choose edit, and uh, tweak the pose as uh, required by the feedback. Once everyone is happy with the new pose, the pose can be submitted, of course, to our versioning system and shared to the others. If we open the previous scene and go to the poses tab, we can see that uh, the pose results to be out of date. The animator can just right click on that specific pose and choose reapply, and the pose will be updated. Like the text system, also the poses rely on a shared library, so we can easily script the update of the different poses or check the status on the different scenes, all in batch. And also we, might, uh, we also have the ability to uh, fade the poses with the current animation in a way that we can uh, have a nice blending uh, transitions. Let's talk a bit about uh, data management. As you can imagine, the text system and the post system is the animator's work. But on the technical side, they introduced a lot of additional data to be managed. In fact, now for a single uh, Maya SIM file, we have rigs that may be updated any time. We have different uh, takes stored inside this scene. And for each one of them, we have different poses. We have explicit dependencies like the rigs, but the poses and takes are implicit. So how we could uh, make sure that uh, everything is nice and uh, in sync? We created an overseer tool that basically uh, is the answer to this question. Here you can see basically the same dependency graph uh, you have seen before. On the left, the animator can uh, load different uh, scene files and uh, quickly check what is the synchronization status of the pose, of the uh, scene file. On the right, you can get information about uh, the takes contained inside the scene file and the uh, pose's uh, synchronization status, and a uh, text log of uh, what is the synchronization status. Let's see how it works in action. We can load uh, a specific folder with all uh, its all subfolders and contained uh, scene files. The tool loads in background uh, the, dependency, um, the dependencies of the scene file and checks for the synchronization status. From here, you can get the version status, the takes the synchronization, the poses, and uh, the file owner. If you click on a specific Maya scene, you can see, as I said before, the takes contained there and uh, check if everything is in sync. And of course, the dependency graph.
Moreover, the overseal handles uh, the batch update process of the poses and the exports in the engine. When we load the, the different uh, SIM files, you can see that uh, only specific SIM files are checked. This corresponds to the Maya file that needs to be updated. It may sound like something very simple, but uh, if you think about scaling such amount of data with all the takes, exporting everything every time is just uh, a lot time consuming and risky. As you can see here, the batch exporter selects not only the specific SIM files, but also the takes that needs to be updated. We have a lighter version of uh, the overseer for the cinematics. On the left, we have the, cinema, the different cinematics. And on the right, we have the different shots that belong to the cinematics. Like before, just watching at the icons, you can get a visual feedback on what is out of date. And you can see a play blast of the specific shot or the whole sequence. Every time the animator updates a specific shot, the whole sequence preview is automatically regenerated on server side. Let's go a bit uh, deeper on uh, how we realized that the uh, dependency tracking. To track the Maya scene uh, content, we used uh, a sidecar technique. Basically, we have a JSON descriptor describing uh, what's inside uh, a specific Maya file in terms of uh, takes, markers, poses, and rigs. If uh, for some reason uh, the scene is uh, modified outside of our pipeline, a ghost process takes care of regenerating this descriptor by scaffolding the scene file. To checking the synchronization status of the takes, we use a DRTB technique. Every time the animator updates a curve, um, Maya callback triggers a set dirty method on the current take in a way that the animator can just uh, uh, watch the takes and uh, if uh, the current take has been uh, updated, it will be marked with a star. To check the synchronization status of the poses, we use both the dirty B technique as before and the timestamp technique. In fact, the poses are just uh, files, so we could easily check the last time the pose has been updated with the last time the pose has been applied on the specific take. For the export, uh, things are uh, a little bit simpler since the exports are just uh, Maya file, um, sorry, FBX file that uh, are uh, the animation that is the animation data that we feed to the to our engine. So we could just check uh, the um, latest update of the FBX with the latest time the current the corresponding take has been updated. Now, the future. We already have in mind some uh, very cool ideas to uh, extend the functionalities of our tool. But uh, of course, for us, the priority is still to improve the overall performance and uh, usability of the tools. Maya introduced a cool time editor in the latest version. It is very useful to do nonlinear editing of different clips. And uh, we aim to integrate our tech system with this uh, time editor. And uh, at last, uh, we are working for having uh, a tighter Mayan engine workflow in a way that uh, we can short the time from Maya to the engine and uh, transfer metadata from, the Ma from Maya to the engine. So this concludes our talk. Uh, I just want to thank you all for being here in behalf of the Ubisoft Milan and uh, Ubisoft Paris Studios. This project was really made by heart by every person in the studio. And of course, we had a lot of fun working with that. So thank you. And uh, these, are our, uh, these are our contacts. Feel free to contact us for uh, uh, questions or just uh, uh, get in contact. And I guess we have time for uh, Q&A. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does this work? Uh, I can also just shout. Um, 
Oh, there we go. Hi. Hi, I'm Alex. I work at Ride. Um, first of all, thanks for the game. That's awesome. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I think the opera scene is probably one of the funniest moments I had in games ever. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how you hook up animations within the game? Is there an HSM running or is it literally just one sequential animation after the other? How are you guys blending between animations during runtime? Um, all right. Um, it depends, but usually we, um, we have our animation system with, uh, which are in a property tool of uh, Zodrop. And uh, they're usually uh, connected to states, so it, they're played uh, sequentially. But it supports also the use of uh, layers, uh, if you want. So it, it depends on the feature. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I was just curious about uh, how you give your feedback back to your animators, because you had like a little sketch over the like, do, what's your system? Do you have like an in-house tool or anything? Uh, not really. Uh, usually, um, the feedback is based mostly on uh, recording in engine, and uh, we we do use uh, drawovers if needed. But we have several steps of uh, validation. Actually, we have a very a first one uh, very 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 soon um, to get uh, overall approval uh, by the brands and all the people involved uh, to, to get if the idea is right. And then uh, the more uh, we move forward, uh, it moves into polishing details. Uh, so for those, uh, uh, usually it's uh, we have we actually have a, a tool that uh, generates. Uh, play blast uh, um, of uh, the animation from several camera angles to speed up this process. And it's what we usually do, for example, to get approvals from the Rabbids brand of, uh, or from Nintendo. It's just ease the process. And, uh, and then it's just uh, we have dailies uh, to get the feedback from uh, the whole team. Uh, and uh, basically, that, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was wondering if uh, are you able to get real-time playback with all that info in the Maya scenes? Are your rigs pretty light that you're able to do that? Well, we, we started uh, three years and a half ago. Uh, we started with Maya 2014. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, migrating to the latest versions. And uh, of course, we will uh, um, improve our rigs to, make, to take advantage of all the new features like the GPU caching or uh, anything else, the parallel evaluation, of course. And uh, there was a nice talk on yesterday about uh, forward-facing rigs, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very inspiring for us. It totally blew, blew my mind on yesterday, <laughs> so I, for sure, I'll uh, start uh, from uh, with that ideas. Yeah, it, it's one of the areas we'll uh, focus on uh, the most uh, moving forward to add uh, real-time feedback uh, in, in our scene. Uh, I, I think uh, there's the latest version of uh, Maya. There's a beta right now that uh, they are working on it to to to, to remove the, the need to do to, to make play blast at all. So that, that's super cool. It's uh, it's it's uh, a good frame rate, but uh, for gameplay animations it's real time. But for the cinematics, it's still not there, and uh, that's what we are aiming for. Also, gameplay yeah. was able to get real time on this project. The, I'm sorry? Um, so the gameplay sequences, the takes, were able to get real-time playback? Yeah, but not for those, time. yes, yes. The, uh, it was uh, mostly, f the, the issues were mostly on uh, some sequences uh, that were heavy, m very heavy with uh, many characters and the uh, environment and so on. Yeah, I, I can tell you that uh, what we did for uh, having these uh, more efficient uh, animation layers, uh, part of the um, handling of the animation layers of, in Maya has been uh, rewrote in a way that uh, could be more efficient. Uh, I can give you maybe a deeper uh, insight. If you think about the corresponding curves belonging, animation curves belonging to the same take, to the same animation layers, the Maya standard uh, way of uh, enabling, of disabling this layer is to turn on and off the lock of these curves. What we do re uh, really is just uh, uh, deferral, deferral, sorry, doing a deferred evaluation of the uh, lock and unlock curves in a way that uh, Maya doesn't have to wait to change the lock status of all the curves. It just basically delays these after the Maya goes in idle. 
I don't know if that's clear, my English. <laughs> you know, Thank you very we, much. we have an additional layer as Italians. We have to <laughs> <coughs> convert. Thank you. And also another uh, uh, nice tip for uh, everyone. For the cinematics, we used a lot the uh, GPU cache with the, for the environment. And that uh, dramatically uh, improved the frame rate of the cinematics. Uh, good talk. I appreciate that. Um, can you talk more about how you decided where to split the scene? It looked like you had uh, multiple Maya files per character, and how you decided to split this Maya scene has these takes, and this other Maya scene has these takes, and go more into how you where you decided to split it up. Uh, it's mainly based on uh, features, and uh, we usually try to gather the. Um, the um, animation clips uh, that uh, you'll probably have to iterate on uh, the most uh, when, uh, like for, for example, the locomotion ones, we tend to keep them together because uh, there's a lot of iteration on those, uh, you know, you yeah, just one, maybe you, will, uh, you have to fix the other one. And, or for example, for uh, the attacks uh, or the variations, uh, like all, this, all the, 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 the clips that uh, are logically connected in some way, we try to keep them in the same file. If uh, they are just split separated, uh, then uh, it's, we, we probably keep on different files. Or if uh, in, we have usually two animators uh, working on the, um, a character at any given time, so if uh, they're working on two features like uh, damages and uh, acting, for, for example, we keep, try to keep that, those uh, separated so they can uh, work on at the same time without you know, having an impact on each other. Great, thank you. Welcome. Hi, thanks for the talk. Oh, sorry. Um, did the animators have to fight sort of the animation compression that might happen when they move the, because I noticed you were able to get some very specific smear frames with some of the um, animations. Was that ever an issue, and did the animators have to learn to work around it, or was it the other way around? Um, we had some, uh, generally speaking, no. Um, it's, we got uh, most of the time one-on-one -on -one, uh, um, match between Maya and the engine. But there are some cases where uh, there are, I don't know, some props uh, down uh, the, the hierarchy, down the chain, and uh, we have a prop that has to stay in some place. Or there's the idol in uh, the character section menu, where uh, the, there's a, in, in places where uh, there are specific contacts and the really, really detailed animations, you can probably notice a slightly uh, some, some glitches uh, there, but it's it's very very so it's like hard to notice. Good yeah. enough, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> we could tell you where, but we will not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my favorite part of the game was walking through the game world and seeing the rabbits on the side, like slapping each other and oh, yeah. and doing all those different animations. And so I was wondering, from a creative standpoint, how you went about. Uh, figuring out what those would be and sort of divvying out the task. All right. Um, we actually have one amazing animator that uh, works uh, worked on those. Uh, wow. She has uh, a lot of experience with the rabbits. She's worked with, I think, on all the games uh, ever created. So she's a master at that. Wow. And uh, the way we usually work is uh, she brainstorms idea and uh, she creates these uh, sequences, and, uh, and then uh, we try to fit them in the world where it makes sense. Or sometimes it's the, uh, the other way around. We just uh, look at the environment and uh, see if uh, there's anything that sparks uh, a cool idea, and uh, we just uh, try. And then we try to understand where it's probably uh, best to put them in a way that it doesn't uh, annoy the player, but it can, they can be noticed. You know, they are there to give uh, life to the world, and uh, I mean, and the rabbits must be doing something while yeah. <laughs> they are, no? So. Thanks. I, I was amazed by the amount of unique animation in the game. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Um, thanks for that talk. Um, your implementations on um, letting animators quickly iterate over several hundreds and hundreds of files blew my mind. Um, and how well your tool was connected to source control, that was amazing. Um, 
my question was um, you have so much of animation content that's being pumped out um, on the runtime side um, does the tool help the runtime in loading these animation assets separately or do you does the tool employ any strategies in deciding okay this batch of animation get content gets loaded first and then this other batch gets loaded conditionally does the tool allow um, any content author to specify that this batch of content needs to be loaded all the time and this batch of content can be loaded at some other time? Uh, can you reformulate the question? Maybe I just, I just lost the last part. Uh, I, I don't know if you were uh, telling us if you can uh, separate the takes in different scene files or uh, something like that. Um, I actually was talking more about um, conditional loading of these animation assets on the oh, runtime okay. side. Did the tool have any strategies to suggest that certain animation content should be loaded all the time and certain content only on, on uh, You mean on engine side, right? Uh, did the, uh, my question was, did the tool make any improvements on the metadata okay. layer? Uh, okay, uh, so the way the engine works right now is uh, the, the clips are loaded uh, for any character that is uh, in gameplay. But, for example, for cinematics, uh, to avoid uh, the load of uh, um, usually, to, 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 to avoid loading uh, usual, uh, u usual useless uh, animations, what we usually do is uh, we have uh, uh, specific characters made for that, so in, for those, uh, those uh, basically don't load anything, so do not overload uh, the game. Okay, and uh, I also really appreciated the dependency graph that you showed that, that helped, you know, visualize where things are going and what's dependent on what else. Um, so as part of that, was there any visualization tool that you used um, that showed how animations were being shared across multiple um, characters, for example, and were there any challenges that you faced in sharing animation content among several characters that have different skeletons and different rigs, for example? Uh, yeah, sharing was uh, an issue. Uh, in fact, most of, uh, of the, the, the animations are specific, but we can, uh, it happened that we shared the stuff between uh, the um, rabbits, for example, as a starting point, at least. And uh, I, I don't think we, 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 we don't have a we don't have uh, that kind of uh, uh, way of visualizing if uh, how the dependencies are used. We have uh, the um, database that we can query using uh, standard queries to check the dependencies, but it's, it's something separate from uh, Maya. Basically, it uh, um, works on the data that is uh, baked inside the engine to check the dependencies. And uh, the fact of sharing it uh, was. Uh, uh, a challenge for us, uh, mostly because the, the difference in terms of proportions of the characters, but also in terms of uh, in, uh, creative intentions. Mm -hmm. Even the rabbits, uh, as, you, as you saw, uh, they have to convey different personalities. So it was also a creative choice to don't share everything. Maybe we just start from the same file, but after they, they go for their own way. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has a cost in terms of uh, iteration. So that's why we built all this structure to uh, make iteration easier. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm trying to apply those old Looney Tunes techniques of squash and stretch and silhouette to my uh, the game I'm working on. So I studied this game like a textbook because <laughs> I really can't think of a better example. Um, and watching that rabid Kong deform in all those crazy ways was pretty exciting. So do you have any secrets you're willing to share about how to get that sort of crazy deformation without breaking the mesh and breaking the rig? You mean on the technical side or on the artistic side, or both? Or both. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to reply on the technical side. It is, uh, it is challenging. Uh, we use it, uh, uh, some parts of the rig are uh, automated, some parts are uh, handily crafted, crafted, and that was the secret to uh, make that kind of freedom we have on, on the rigs. But uh, it, it was challenging because you have everything uh, basically on joint based. And at some point of the production, we introduced a kind of a blend shape based on vertex shader. Uh, we created a tool for automating all this stuff. And uh, that gave us a little bit more freedom in terms of the formations. But uh, the challenge for us was to let everything work real time with just joints. And uh, yeah, that's it. And yeah, the advice is uh, 
Of course, as mere friends and information have to be felt but not really seen, so uh, the, the, the focus should be in uh, keeping the volumes and try to, get it to, to avoid uh, getting the character out of, uh, you know, out of his, uh, his, uh, his design. Um, but what we usually do, we go broad, we exaggerate it, uh, and then uh, if it's noticeable, if it, uh, it, it just doesn't work, we scale it uh, back. It's, it's better than uh, go up little by little. You know. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think, okay. And uh, if he, anyone has any question more, we can, we'll be able uh, um, to show some of these tools at the Ubisoft Lounge this uh, afternoon. We'll be there to answer any question. So if you want to drop by and uh, say hello, we'll be there. So thank you all. Thank you.